Welcome everybody. Upside down. <laughs> um, we are at another class for Sharp Tafai, and I want to start and give a heads up. Number one, 60 days are coming. I know that we're not thinking about it, but we are thinking about it. Elul and Tishrei are coming up, and we have a program called SAI Systematic Avoida Initiative for 60 days. And it is all about preparing and living with every single day of Elul and Tishrei. Every day there is one teeny tiny, there we go, little page of reading that helps you prepare for your L and your Tishrei. And we give out beautiful, gorgeous um, journals that then you journal and you keep it between you and Hashem. You do not have to tell anybody. So as long as you do your daily reading every single day and you do at least one journal a week, because on the bottom it has journal prompts, then you get to join us every other week and we have a program with an incredible speaker and we give out awesome prizes. So we've given out some spark, we've given out a Bluetooth speaker, we've given out jewelry, we've given out cushions, we've given out horse arms, we've given out cars and gift cards to food. It's just awesome. So just a heads up, keep it in your calendar. We're Shredish Elo, we're doing a kickoff and that's coming up. Second announcement. All of these books are currently for sale and we are we are running out. So if you like one, each of them is ten dollars. Life points, planes, secrets of the mikva. One by one. We have um Kuntras Hatsvila, which my husband actually did a whole series of 15 minute citizen in the morning share. So they're all on all of our podcasting platforms and on YouTube. And this one is 15. And I think there's one only one left because somebody already asked for this one. So um, I have one more left. Yes, you may. <laughs> okay. Also, last but not least, we have our Shadokim course, which is running right now every Monday. We have beautifully and geniusly made worksheets and um, notes for every single class. You also get the access to the recording on podia.com. So you have all the recordings over there. You have all the PDFs, all the worksheets, and you get the clarity to really know how to do them to the best of your possible abilities as, it, as the rabbi speaks about that you need to do your part, not just anyway, wait for Prince Charming to go up on your so you're always invited to join us Monday night. You can register at livingstudis.org forward slash should of course. And for tonight's class, we are these are back in stock. They were sold out in every single store, and we far Hashem have back in stock. They're $22 as opposed to I think most stores is $27.88. Um, so you're more than welcome to purchase one for here today. Okay. We are on page third. No, no, just page. We are on page twenty-four. On page twenty-four, last week we finished off. Um, last week we finished off. We finished off the list of ten reasons why it is so much better to have Bittachon and Hashem then to be able to print money freely. We think that someone who's an alchemist or a modern day alchemist would be someone who is a money launderer. We think that he's got his life all settled. He can print out money, cha-ching, and life is good. We gave 10 reasons and each one of them with a lot of explanations as to why having the Tantan and Hashem and really truly trusting Hashem is much better. And now we are up to the section which is titled Financial Satisfaction. So, okay, so let's start there. Page 24, middle to bottom of the page, Financial Satisfaction. One second, if you guys, this is very loud, can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Um, okay. Having finished enumerating the 10 ways in which a person who has the token is superior to an alchemist, the author con 
continues on with other Torah advantages to having the Tzavah, right? Because as part of the introduction, make sure you can hear me. Can you hear me? Thumbs up. Okay. Great. Beautiful. Okay. So as part of the introduction, we discussed how um, there are Torah advantages and also physical, plain old, straight up um, materialistic advantages. So having fit, okay, so we said that. So now on page 25, top of the page, among the advantages of Bittachin with regards to Torah observance is that a person who places his trust in Hashem will utilize his finances correctly. Now, let's take a moment to think about this. <laughs> Hello. A few years ago, when Marketplace opened up, it was very interesting. And a lot of people kept wondering, how is it that the demographic shopping at Marketplace might be a little different than the demographic shopping at Empire Culture, let's say, which for some interesting trivia for everyone who doesn't yet know they're owned by the same person um so it's hilarious to make your competition by yourself but anyway so at one point somebody was saying um how it's very interesting to see the different types of demographics and how we find it that sometimes um they don't always match up and the type of person who's willing to spend that extra bit, let's say, to go to marketplace and that get get that extra different feel, might have a different, um, might be a different type of person. So, we started having a discussion. This was at a Shabbos meal several years ago, and we started having a discussion about the way we choose to use our money. And it's possible you may not even realize that. Some people that you know so incredibly well, you spend so much time with them, you may not realize how much money they actually make. And you can't even know that based on how much money they spend and what they spend it on. Because many times, incredibly wealthy people, let's say, will walk around with slippers and the uh, raggedy clothes. And all their money is going into specific things, whether it's investments or savings or their children's uh, or 401ks or whatever. And so they're making a ton of money, but you don't really see it in the flashy things that we might always see. And it's possible that sometimes we, we, we can't gauge by what we see. So here in a from person's home, it's sometimes hard to see this as well as we're about to read the way we spend our money may not be commensurate with the how much money we're getting and the way people see how we spend our money might also not be matching so let's see let's continue page 25 this applies both to rich and poor and poor people who have been toughened and what do you want to mean by this it means among the advantages of Bittachon with regards to Torah observance is that a person who places his trust in Hashem will utilize his finances correctly. For if he has money, he will hurry to fulfill his obligation to Hashem, such as buying kosher tefillin, tzitzes, extra food for Shabbos meal, and the like, as well as fulfilling his obligation to other people, such as fulfilling the commandment of charity, giving out loans to those in need, and so on. He will do so willingly and generously. There's um, a beautiful story. I actually forgot to bring the book, but there's a beautiful story. Another character that I speak about a lot, who I really appreciate. Um, and his name is Rabbi Leib Kramer, who is one of the core people who began, Hasidim, who began Lubavitch in, in, um, in Montreal. And in the beginning, it was just nine students that literally survived by incredible miracles. They survived getting out of Advats during World War II. Pashit miracles, to, they smuggled themselves into Latvia and then they smuggled themselves to Shanghai. And it was just like an insane story. And somehow after many, 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 many months, they were finally able to make it to this side. 
although they were denied access into America, but they were granted access into Canada. So these students, they're like long payers and like looking like back in the day, Chassidim. They land in Montreal, which is very modern. People were not particularly from back then or not to showing it in such an extent, to such an extent. And from day one, they came with many other types of students and the community offered for them to host them at a resort far away, you know, outside of the, and just relax. You know, they had just lived through all of these traumatic experiences and they said, okay, take some time, relax, get, you know, <laughs> gather your breath, like, <sighs> you know, and everybody else took it up, took, they said, okay, fine, we'll do it. But the Siddim of the Frida Karba, these nine students from Advats, they said, no, the Frida Karba sent us here on a mission. And from tomorrow morning, we're starting a yeshiva. And literally, they went knocking from door to door, finding students to start this yeshiva. And they began, they sat down and they learned. And from that point on, Montreal became a whole, I mean, it was a whole several years of, of a process. But during this time, it was these nine Bacharim who suddenly turned outward and they said, okay, instead of us being learning, we're going to start a yeshiva and we're going to change this community. I mean, they weren't out to change the community per se, but that's what ended up happening. So a beautiful story about this is that Rabbi Leib Kramer was the director. And as everybody knows, the director's salary versus a teacher's salary has slight discrepancy. Um, and he had a salary, Baruch Hashem. They fundraised and they got paid to, you know, the tuition and et cetera, et cetera. And he had a salary. And it happened to be that all the other teachers ended up getting married. They were single at the time. So they all ended up getting married before him. And at one point, one of the teachers, which was his friend, they were companions. They like survived this entire experience together. One of the teachers started getting married. Uh, well, he was, you know, engaged and went on his process to get married and Rabbi Kramer realized that this teacher's salary wasn't going to be able to pay for his new married life. And without blinking, he just switched the salaries. And he literally gave the director salary to this guy who was a teacher because he realized this guy needs it more than him. And that is wild. That is beyond. And this is the type of mentality that we're discussing here. Let's read it again. For if he has money, he will hurry to fulfill his obligations to Hashem, such as buying kosher tefillin, tzitzes, extra food for Shabbos meal, and the like, as well as fulfilling his obligations to other people, such as fulfilling the commandment of charity, giving out loans to those in need, and so on. He will do so willingly and generously. That is someone who has, that is someone who can have parnasa, can have abundance, and yet he puts it in the right place. He gives it towards the right things. Another famous story, I'm not going to go into it because everybody, I hope everyone knows the story of Yosef Makar Shabbos. He would save all of his money and every, every amount that he would save would go to, to honor Shabbos. And through that, he was benched with an incredible, miraculous story. He became one of the wealthiest people in the town. And the concept is that when we care for Shabbos, Shabbos cares for us. And when we put our money in the right places, then we're using our wealth for the good. And that's what we're meant to be doing. So it's possible a from Yid may not be walking around with, I don't know, whatever fancy car and the, the latest gadgets and the latest outfit, but you know that his investment, he's putting his money in the right things. He is making sure that his mezuzahs get checked. He's making sure that his clothes are tzniyas. He's making sure that he's, oh, uh oh. Um, I don't know. Oh, really? <laughs> All of your faces went. <laughs> I didn't know that. So that was a uh, Um He is making sure to be putting his money in all the right places. Okay. So that's on the positive. That's someone who has wealth and is able to put it and donate it and use his home to have for ring-ins or whatever it is that you need to be doing with your money that's for the good. That's where you need to be putting that money. 
Yes. I, I was gonna, yes, yes. Absolutely, yes, I did wanna, that's who I was thinking of. <laughs> yes, the Rabashkin family, they get a shout out. I, if he ever hears this, he's gonna give me a speech. But it's said with a lot of love. He has, um, Rabbi Meister Bashkin is in Crown Heights. And if anyone hasn't yet been to Simcha at his home, it, it's bound to happen because it is an incredible place. And they literally use every ounce of that home for the good. We, several years ago, the show where my husband Davins um, expat, grew out for Tishri. Most shuls in Crown Heights, they move somewhere else for Tishri because they just don't fit wherever they usually are. So he grew out and he offered his face. And he was not only hosting all the Israeli visitors, he was feeding them. This was even for sukkah. So he had a sukkah, he had like three different sukkahs in every, every ounce of his yard. That was before he even built this ginormous sukkah thing. <laughs> sukkah thing he does now. Um, and at one point, the line to the restroom downstairs was looking a little long. And he literally dragged people into the upstairs bathroom and said, please, please just use it. It's okay. And people were like, oh my God, you're mad. <laughs> but he insisted, and this is, yes, every ounce of that home has been used for chesed and goodness and just Hashem should bench him with absolute brachis every, in every, yeah, in every way. Okay. Speaking of benching for absolute brachas, this actually reminds me. Give me one second. We have today's share is for Rafur Shlema for Shulamis Geula Bas Fagel. Shava Rafur Shlema and only revealed good. Okay. Um, okay, now we're on to if he does not. Now this one, let's, let's go. Now it's the opposite. So now we have to, we learned that we need to use our money for all good things. And the reason why the Abishur gave us money is to be used for these good things. But if Chasushon, he does not have money, then he will pay attention to the fact that the lack of money is actually a kindness from Hashem upon him. <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> we have to read that one more time. If he does not have money, then you will pay attention to the fact that the lack of money is actually a kindness from Hashem upon him. How so? This is because as a result of lacking money, he has been relieved of the obligation to Hashem and to other people which would have been incumbent upon him due to his money. So let's let's see what that, what does that even mean? What does that mean that he's going to be relieved to these obligations? So let's look at the asterisk. So look below. Which would have been incumbent upon him during uh, due to his money? Were he to be wealthy, he might not live up to his obligations and consequently might be punished. Now that he has no money, he is free of his responsibility and will surely not be punished for failing in his obligation. Now, let's, in order to understand that, let's take, um, let's move back in history for a little bit. And we're going to be at a Fabrengen Tufshin Tesvav. It's a Fabrengen on Purim. And the Rebbe actually spoke about this. I'm sure if anybody knows exact quotes, you can absolutely share it, but I'll give the general gist of the idea um, that the Rebbe spoke in great detail and it was a very intense talk about the struggles of being wealthy, the struggles of having wealth. And he said how it's so hard for this reason, it's so hard for this reason, kind of like what we're saying here. And it's, it, you, you, now you have to, it's hard to give up that money in a certain sense. It's hard to, you have it and it makes you who you are or somebody could get carried away and think that that's what makes them who they are. And so it's hard to give that up. And 
et cetera, et cetera. And the Rebbe spoke about it very clearly. And then the Rebbe explained um, in America, being that everything gets decided on by votes. So we're gonna do a similar style here. And the Rebbe said, please raise your right hand with, with Chayis, with, you know, if you're willing to take on this challenge, if you'd like to be wealthy. And can you imagine, the Rebbe basically spends, I don't know how exactly how long it was, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour, just telling you how hard it is having so much money, what a struggle, what a struggle, what a struggle, what a struggle. And the Rebbe says, okay, now raise your hand if you want it. So I'm sure you can imagine the room was uh, hesitant. <laughs> and lo and behold, some people really did raise their hands. And it was a, a very small crowd to the point that the rabbi said, I'm, you know, in a certain sense, like I'm disappointed. Like, why is no one else taking on this challenge? And at the end of, like at the end of the whole discussion, Baruch Hashem, some people did raise their hands and those people really were benched with Asherus. They were very, they became very wealthy. And the rabbi said, for, um, for you taking on this responsibility, it, it's a challenge, but it's also a huge bracha. Um, right now is an ace ratzin, and now is a good opportunity to take it on and, and do it. And so those people really were. And the Rebbe explained that that money should be used for good things. It should be to give tzedakah. It should be to build institutions. It should be to change the world. So we see that very much. Um, I don't, I don't think, no, for sure not. Um, I don't think Rabbi Zalman Deitch was there at the time, but as I'd, I've brought this book in before, how we can see an incredible example of someone who took those challenges. He, his business got burnt down, like the entire thing he had to start from scratch. He had so many trials and tribulations. And yet at the same time, he was able to build the entire JCM. Basically, he's one of the main donors who donated towards the JCM. He was able to give towards so many of the Rebbe's Pulas. And so we can see that as much as it's, it's a struggle, it's also a huge bracha. And that's exactly what the Rebbe wanted us to know. If this is the type of bracha that we're going to take, so we should see that struggle and we should use it for the good. Yes. It was in his basement, right? Yeah. Powerful. Um, okay. Okay, so we explained that. Let's go back to the main text on page 26. Another advantage of not being wealthy is he also has fewer worries about guarding his money and taking care of it. As we discussed in the past, that the alchemist now has all the schlep to carry all his gold and he has to keep it safe, et cetera, et cetera. As has been said regarding one of his pious men, one, sorry, as has been said regarding one of the pious men that he would say, may Hashem save me from the scattering of the mind. They asked him, what is scattering of the mind? He replied, were I to have money at the port of each river and the heights of each city. A man who is wealthy often has possessions in many locations. As a result, his thoughts are scattered in different places, referred to as scattering of the mind. Okay, page 27. This is what the sages of blessed memory meant when they said, the more possessions, the more worry. I'm sure we all know that. We've all been uh, doing Perkei Avais for the last several months. And when they also said in Perkei Avais, who is truly wealthy? A person who is content with his lot. A person who trusts in Hashem will receive all the benefits of the money. I mean to say the, men, the benefits of his livelihood, while the disturbing thoughts of a wealthy person and his constant worry will be withheld from him. As a wise man, uh, everyone's okay. Um, said the sleep of the laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the satiety, how do you say that? Anyone know? Okay, well, 
figure it out together. Of the rich does not allow him to sleep. The satiety, satiety. Okay. Anyway, we're all good. Um, okay. So that that aspect of the rich does not allow him to sleep. Okay. So the fourth Torah benefit, in contrast to a person who does not have the tachin, is the person who does will utilize his financial situation, be he rich or poor. To further his service of Hashem, while a person who lacks betachin will be constantly stressed and unable to serve Hashem properly. Um, there's actually a famous story of Rav Mendel Fortefas, and one of the many years he was imprisoned, he managed to sneak in and got to go to this freezing cold just like i don't know if exactly he broke through the ice but basically he broke through the ice to go to the mikvah era of shabbos and not only did he do so but every day out of his small portion of um, food that he received he would save a little bit and he would put it in his pocket and he would make he would save and make two little teeny tiny leftovers and make his lacha mishnah so to speak for Shabbos so not only would did he have his clothes but he also had his little lacha mishnah for Shabbos and he took it off and he jumped right into the into this freezing cold river and um, the guards weren't so happy with him for obvious reasons and they actually took his clothes so as soon as Rabendal came back out he sees his clothes are entirely gone, and not only are his clothes gone, but so is his little Lech Mishnah. And I mean, if any of, I mean, okay, I'll speak for myself. If I were him, I probably would have been a bit downhearted or depressed or upset or any of those not so positive things. I mean, I'm working on myself one day. Hopefully, I'll be as awesome as the mental foot of us. But anyway, he, his reaction was to dance and he's freezing cold wet absolutely undressed <laughs> and he is just dancing away and he danced with such simcha that actually the guards were so upset that they came back and they gave him back his clothes and they said you fool you lost your mind like you lost your marbles you lost your mind are you are you you crazy? Like, how are you dancing right now? You're freezing, you're cold, you have no clothes, you have no food. How on earth are you dancing? And Rabendel replied that it didn't make a difference. I'm still, what am I put in this world for? I'm put in, in this world to serve Hashem. Okay, so back in the, you know, before this, I thought my coat and my clothes would help me serve Hashem. And I thought that my little bits of uh, Lecha Mishnah would help me serve Hashem. But once they're gone, I realize it must mean that there's no separation between me and Hashem, and it's just me and Hashem, and this is the way I need to serve Hashem now. And so why should I be stressed out? And not only that, but he actually said to them, he said, and due to this, I, I, knew, it, I knew things couldn't get any worse. And at the end of the day, they actually gave him back his clothes. So <laughs> Baruch Hashem, um, I actually saw two versions of the story so i put both versions together but these are the versions of the story that i um that i found when i was looking for the mucker okay so that is someone who could truly see both sides of the coin and use his whether it's his financial situation which we know he did he was a, a businessman before this and he actually gave a lot of money towards smuggling people and towards helping Yidin. And also with the lack of financial situation where he was still able to do everything he could to serve Hashem properly. Okay, so now this is an opportunity for us to take a moment and think about our personal, wherever we're holding. I recently heard um, there was a study that basically asked people how they felt about their finances. And apparently everyone says that if only they had about 10% more than what they currently make, then they would be much happier. And it's just so interesting that 
10% of what we currently, if, if only we would make a little bit more, we'd be much happier. If only, if only, if only, if only. So let's take a moment and think wherever place we're holding on in our personal finances, how, whether it's because of the wealth and we are, and I'm sure everybody holds themselves somewhere in the middle. There's no black and white, there's shades of gray. So in the times when you feel your wealth, to make a conscious effort to use it for all the right things. And in a time when you feel that extra struggle in the pocket, to realize that Hashem is doing this as a, an incredible chesed and that this is, we can use this opportunity to connect with Hashem regardless of how much money we have and appreciate that. Okay. Financial responsibility, we're on page 27. Among the Torah benefits of Betachin is that the money of the person who trusts in Hashem will not disturb him from trusting in Hashem. And neither his wealth nor lack of it is cause for him to sin. This is because he will not rely on his money. Rather, he considers it as a deposit, which he has been instructed to use in certain ways and for certain purposes for a designated amount of time. Can you imagine that? Imagine you get your paycheck and in your paycheck, it already says this piece where it says, okay, you know, 50% uh, of it goes towards this. You know, it, it comes, the paycheck already comes allotted. 50% of it goes towards this. 30% of it goes towards that. 10% of it goes towards this. And whatever's left, it says someone else's name. Can you imagine that? Avistra gives you this paycheck and it already says somebody else's name on it. But Hashem wants, wants to give you the great chesed that you'll be the one to hold it for them and give it to them at the right time. So if we look at our finances as this is not my money and if I give it to someone else, then it's no longer mine and I'm no longer safe. But we realize that we're holding it for that person and the English just gave it to us with that person's name already attached. How much easier would it be to give tzedakah? How much easier would it be to see this? And we, I know, I know we're all bombarded with charity campaigns and messages and calls and we see every ad on every news website everywhere. How much easier would it be to give to those things if we knew that it wasn't really our money? Those $18 already have that campaign's name on it. It's, it's a mindset. It's a total mind shift. And we can, we can work on seeing it that way. Okay. Um, let's read the, the asterisk. Okay. For the purpose of designated amount of time. So designated amount of time. Hashem granted his greater financial means for the duration of the time that he saw fit, that he be his agent to dispense his money. So that amount of time that we're meant to, we're meant to be Hashem's shliach, that's the amount of time we're meant to have this money for. Um, okay. If his wealth continues to remain with him, he will not rebel as a result of it, nor will he remind the one whom he has been instructed to be kind to of his kindness, right? So if he's the one that's giving, being kind to someone else, so he's not the one that comes and says, you know, I was the one that gave it to you. I'm the one that, right? Like, I'm so nice to give it to you. Nor will he ask to be repaid for his kindness, nor will he ask to be thanked or praised. Instead, he will thank his creator, may he be blessed, who put him in the position to be the means for the goodness of the recipient. A person who trusts in Hashem does not consider his money to be his. Rather, he sees it as Hashem's money, which has been placed in his care. Therefore, he will not take credit or ask for appreciation when he uses his money to help others. Instead, he will thank Hashem for being chosen to have the opportunity to help those in need. How beautiful is that? I want to share another incredible story. This is um, a fairly new book. 
and it's written by Miriam Paltiel Neville. And it's written about stories of her childhood and stories about her grandfather, who was Rabbi Stroll Neveller. And Rabbi Stroll Neveller was a incredible chassid, a very a famous chassid, who spent many, many years teaching children in underground yeshiva. Um, and at one point, that's a long story, but in the end, there was an informer who um, told on him and he ended up getting caught and he was imprisoned and it's a whole very sad saga. Baruch Hashem, he survived and he came back out and literally, Mamish, the next day, exactly the next day, he went right back out and taught the students. So that in of itself is a story. But anyway, this whole book is beautiful and I definitely suggest everyone read it. But the story I'm going to tell now is that at one point, um, his daughter was who was married to her husband and they had three children, two boys and a girl. And his daughter sadly passed away. And so the children ended up being um, orphaned of their mother. And they... The father used to work at a bank and for a certain amount of time he used to generally they lived in moscow and he worked at a bank and at one point he had to go to to um uzbekistan to for the bank but because he was traveling and because the grandparents lived in tashkent which is a city in uzbekistan so he went and he dropped off his kids and these three kids got to live with their grandparents for a certain amount of time and she has beautiful stories of what kind of a lifestyle they had in Tashkent and how their grandfather and grandmother lived. So their grandmother's name was Hannah. And she used to spend, she was very close with the granddaughter, Miriam, because she was the only girl. So they got to spend a lot of time together. And at one point, um, Baba Hannah sent, sent Miriam with some coins to the neighbor across the street. And to give context, their life in Tashkent was not easy. They lived in a little hut, all of them in one room. They had a little burner with a you know, kerosene burner, and that was it for their heat, for their cooking, just one little burner. The floor was dust. It was an earthen. They didn't have anything under. You know, They had their little cots on top, and that was it. And all of them shared one room. And so her grandmother told her, go to that family. They lost their job and they're really struggling. Give them this, give them this coin. So she went over, knocked on the door, and a young woman came to answer the door. And when she answered the door and she opened the door, she saw inside they actually had wooden floors. And she couldn't believe it. What do you mean? We live across the street and we have totally different houses. Not only did they have wooden floors, but they had this big stove where they got to had several burners, just like huge chiddush. And then at the same time, their stuff seemed to be scattered all over the place. They didn't have furniture. And um, little Miriam just couldn't understand, like, how am I giving them a coin when they, in a certain sense, have such a much more luxurious lifestyle? So he came back and he wanted to speak, she wanted to speak to um, her grandmother about it. And her grandmother told her, um, one second, I want to quote, I'll, I'll quote it directly because it's such a beautiful quote. So her grandmother explained that it was tragic that they had, they had to sell all of their lovely things just to buy bread, and now they need help. But in the essence, they used to be very, very wealthy. So she said to her, her grandmother said to her, may Hashem, may blessing and success rain, rain down on your little head if I obey all that my, meaning that she should say to herself, all that my grandparents, my parents, the Rebbe, and all good people tell me to do. Then she said, then she would say, our neighbors across the street used to be rich and now they are poor. We have, we have to help people when they are suffering, rich or poor. 
This was the way of Baba Khanna and her husband, Zayda, Rabbi Stroll Neveler. This was our inheritance to remember, to keep, to share always. And it's so powerful to think about it. Sometimes we might think, you know, that person has a better car. Like, what is he doing? Or that person has a car. I mean, many of us in Crown Heights don't have a car. Or that person has, you know, they seem to be wearing better clothing or whatever. And sometimes we judge what they have. We, not, we may not always know what's happening behind closed doors. We may not always know what's happening in their heart. And to really think about it, that these, the Nevelers didn't have, Pasha didn't have a floor and they gave coins to this family. It gives us a really good appreciation for ourselves that these people, and let's go back one second to page 27. If his wealth continues to remain with him, he will not rebel as a result of it. Nor will he remind the one whom he has been instructed to be kind kind to of his kindness, nor will he ask to be repaid for his kindness, nor will he ask to be thanked or praised. Instead, he will thank his creator, may he be blessed, who put him in the position to be of the, to, sorry, to be the means for goodness of the, for, uh, of the recipient, right? So when we have that in mind, we don't judge anybody else's whatever and expect them to thank us or you know treat us a certain way we just need to do what's right and we need to do what we need to do and with that we're able to appreciate the kindness that Hashem gave us to be able to be the one giving okay any questions I feel like I've been ranting questions comments all good okay you guys are speaking of recipients you guys are okay okay page 28 even if he loses all of his money, I add it all. Even if he loses his money, he will not worry, nor will he mourn its loss. Instead, he will thank Hashem for taking the deposit away from him, just as he thanked him when he was given to him in, his fir in the first place. Wow. That is huge. Imagine how our world would be if we all, the entire world had this mindset. Like, imagine how different business would go, <laughs> how much we would care for each other, how much we would just be there for each other. It's just, it's powerful. Okay, so let's read the asterisk on the bottom. If he loses his money, etc., Hashem tests man in two ways, the test of poverty and the test of wealth. King Solomon asked of Hashem to be tested with neither. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Just feed me my allotted bread, for perhaps I will, I will be overly satiated and deny you, saying, who is God? Meaning, if he's too wealthy, he might just be like, oh, what do I need him for? You know, who is God? Or, or I may become poor and steal and swear in the name of Hashem. Nevertheless, if we were to be tested, the test of wealth would be obviously easier and more rewarding. Therefore, we must ask for the test of wealth and use it properly. On page 28. This explains why King Solomon asked, first asked that he not be tested with poverty. Because if a man needs to be tested, his first request is that it not be the test of poverty which is more difficult and causes more pain and stress as our sages teach poverty makes a man lose his mind and rebel against the will of hashem so let's take a moment to appreciate this why did he say neither give me poverty nor riches right because both of them are a test as we saw as we said it would be a test to have money because then it's harder to give you know it's it feels harder to give stuff that you have more people to pay off. You have more, you have more worries that you're going to, where's your money going to be? How are you going to hold on to it? The test of wealth is a test. The test of lack of wealth, of poverty is also a test. 
you're wondering when's your next paycheck how are you going to pay off all your debts how are you going to you know how are you going to take care of these things and yet when we ask that we should not be tested for neither one we first ask that we shouldn't be tested for poverty the test of wealth is a as as the rabbi spoke and we said we started the class with this and that for bringing the rabbi clearly described it is a test the test of wealth is definitely a test but let's choose the test of wealth over the test of poverty. So as much as we're meant to, and we, as we spoke about here very clearly, we're meant to, even if we don't have the means, and even if we're on the poverty side of the scale, or we feel that we're on the poverty side of the scale, we should be grateful to Hashem, that Hashem for sure knows exactly what he's doing, and he's keeping us from the test of wealth and all of these things. At the same time, we should still dive in, that we should have, we would rather have the test of wealth and make sure to make a proper um, push forward and we should use that money for the right things, which is what we started our share with, right? That the person should use his money for buying kosher tefillin, he should work on his tzitzis, extra food for Shabbos, all of these good things, giving extra tzedakah, giving miser. We, we need to daven for that so we'll be able to use it for all the right things. Okay. Um, okay, so we're on the fourth paragraph on page 28. He will rejoice with his portion, will not seek. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, sorry, I jumped. Third paragraph. Even if he loses his money, he will not worry, nor will he mourn its loss. Instead, he will thank Hashem for taking the deposit away from him, just as he thanked him when it was given to him in the first place. He will rejoice with his portion, will not seek that others be financially harmed. It will not be desirous of other people's money. As a wise man, again, King Solomon said, a righteous man eats to sate his appetite. So let's take a moment. I hope none of us got tested with this, but in the outside world, sometimes people do get tested with this idea that someone else took my money, or if only that person would be stripped of his money, that money would be mine. And um, it's funny, there's a, I can't remember who said it, but I was listening once, I think it was Y.Y. Um, y y Jacobson. If I'm quoting incorrectly, um, please forgive me. But if I remember correctly, it was from a share where he was speaking about the whole concept of Robin Hood. And we think Robin Hood is, you know, this hero and everybody reads these books and I'm for sure there's movies and kids are like, wow, Robin Hood, Robin Hood. Robin Hood is a thief. <laughs> like, let's just be straight up. He's a god of, like, he's a thief. He used to steal money. And when we put that into context, just because you're stealing from the rich doesn't mean that that's the money that should be going to the poor. Hashem doesn't take away a single penny that you're not meant to be taken away of. And Hashem doesn't give a single penny that you're not meant to be receiving. So by being a chacham and saying, oh, I'll be the Robin Hood, I'm gonna cut corners and take away money from that person because that money's meant to be mine. At the end of the day, Hashem is the one that decides where that money is meant to go. And if it's meant to be in his pocket, you can't do anything differently to get it into your pocket. Right? And so therefore, as we started the entire share with, or the entire book, I mean, all the weeks we've been doing this for, make sure that you're doing your things according to Hashem's way. And that to make a keli, to receive more parnasa, needs to be done in the way that Hashem has given you to make a keli. Because if we're doing things in a cutting corners type of way, Hashem's not going to take away from the rich to give to the poor. Hashem gave exactly what he's meant to give to that person and exactly what he's meant to give to this person. That makes sense? Okay. So being that, he will rejoice with his portion. He will not seek that others be financially harmed. Let's read the, the footnote at the bottom or the asterisk at the bottom. Will not seek that others be harmed. A person's jealousy can easily cause them to wish ill on successful people. 
thinking that the other person loses his money, the former will receive it in the latter stead. For a person who trusts in Hashem, this is folly because he knows that no one can take away anything that is designated for another person against the will of Hashem. He therefore knows that the success of another, another does not change his own lot and that there is no need for jealousy or ill will towards others. Someone else getting money does not mean that you're getting less. It's actually very funny because our, um, our yearly campaign generally falls around the same time as another good friend of mine's yearly campaign. And we usually work trying to work so that it's not too close to each other. Um, but it was very interesting because we're very close and we actually discuss our campaigns together and um, our pools are not necessarily in the same place, but it's, it's still funny. So it was very, it was very cute that a few years ago we were discussing it and um, she was actually giving me the names of some of her donors. And I couldn't believe it. This was one of the first times, like one of the first few times that we did it. And I, I couldn't believe it. She's sitting there like giving me names and numbers. She'll call them, meet her at that place and she'll, you know, she'll give you that. And, and I've never seen someone live this. She never for a second felt, if I give her my donor, I'm getting less of a donation. And I saw it in the real you know, fresh, flesh and blood right in front of me. And I couldn't thank her enough. I, I, I was just mind blown. So people can have this mentality and they can live with this. That just because someone else gave a donation to a different organization doesn't mean that that person is not going to give a donation to this organization. Or just because someone else has, you know, hired a different person for the job doesn't mean that you don't have that perfect job waiting for you with your perfect salary, you know, your name on the check already. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the Pasuk does not state that a righteous man eats until his stomach is satisfied because he is satisfied with whatever he has. This Pasuk is brought as proof that the righteous person is happy with his lot and is never desirous of other people's money. Does that make sense? Um, okay, we have a few more minutes. So actually this next one is kind of short. Let's see if we can get it in, okay? So now we officially finished all the pieces, which is hilarious for me to think about, but these are all the Torah benefits. I personally feel very um, materialistic benefits from having all these mentality. And I feel like it really makes a difference in my life. But we'll call that Torah benefits as opposed to just materialistic benefits. So now we go on to page 29. Up until this point, the author has been listing the Torah advantages of Betachin. In the remainder of his introduction, he will discuss the advantages that Betachin brings to a person in his materialistic pursuits. The benefits of Betachin in worldly matters are as follows. Ah, stress free. Among them is the peace of mind from the worries of the world and peace from the nagging of the soul and its pain, which is due to the soul's lack of obtaining its physical desires. A person who does not have betachin is never at peace because he always feels that he is lacking. But a person who has betachin is at rest. He feels secure and is at peace in this world. As it is written, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord the Lord shall be his trust. And in the and as the following Pasuk says, for he shall be like a tree planted by water and by a rivulet spreads its roots. These verses are brought as proof that a person who has betachen is at peace and is neither afraid nor worried even when bad befalls him because he knows he is being taken care of. And I think that's a great, place for us to um, finish here for today. Um, I want to bench everybody that we should take these boosts every week when we join together for Shar B'Tachin. 
and they should really be applied to our, our lives. And we should take a moment to say, where am I stressing out? Where am I worrying about my money? Where could I be using my wealth for better things? Where could I, when I don't feel so wealthy, where could I be seeing the bracha in it and seeing that Hashem has exactly, has given me exactly what I'm meant to be having? And not only that, but um, we shouldn't hope or be jealous for somebody else's uh, finances. We should also see that our paycheck comes and whether we see it in writing or not, it, a certain amount of it has someone else's name on it. And uh, you get to have the incredible benefit of giving it to that somebody else, whether it's $10 that you received, so the $1 goes to someone else. Um, and may we be zaychet to be blessed with the struggle of Parnassah. We should be blessed with the ability to have abundant wealth, to be able to use it for good and to share it with everybody. Yes. Baruch Hashem. Chaim. Any, uh, my pleasure, my pleasure. I'm going to, um, oh.